Hi, this is Steve Hargett on and welcome to the Future of Education com. It's Thursday, December tenth, two thousand nine. And our guest tonight is Elizabeth. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. So glad to have you here. Thank you. There's your glamour shot. <laughs> <laughs> And a book cover that we weren't that crazy. And a book cover that we weren't that crazy about, but we had some issues with our publisher. But you know, it's pretty traditional. It's snappy. It ca it grabs your. But you eye. notice the cover. It's hard not to notice. Yeah. So there's nothing muted about that cover. No, it's not. It's quite. We went took a took it to a bookstore when it was in discussion, and and we polled my daughter and I went and polled a lot of parents at Barnes and Noble and Amazon. And, um, Borders, and they said, "Well, we like we had come up with kind of an Apple-esque cover originally of a child using an iPhone and a, and you know all the different technology." And uh, it, it turns out that a lot of parents actually did like this this cover. They said, "Hey, we noticed it on a shelf, and we're tired because we raise young children." So <laughs> <laughs> you mean just look at the cover, and it will wake you up. That's right. We notice it. We're kind of in a haze all the time because we have toddlers, so we would totally see this cover. That is so funny. So, Richard, let us know if the sound is still being clipped for you. Um, um, Elizabeth, he's just, Richard's making a note that the sound is clipped. I don't know if that's um, you or me or if it even could be his connection. But uh, do go ahead and speak up as loud as you can, and I'll try and speak up loudly here as well. And let, and let me know if it uh, doesn't get better. Okay. So we'll do a little bit of a brief introduction. If you let me know, and I can. No, go ahead. No, I said let me know. I can. I got it as loud as I can, but let me know. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Future of Education is sponsored by Learn Central. LearnCentral.org is my passion project. I work for Illuminate, and we are building a social, a free social network for educators, Facebook-like in scope, so you can find each other. It has Illuminate baked in, so you can actually communicate and work with each other. You can hold parent-teacher meetings. You can do all kinds of fun stuff in Learn Central. Plus, there's a free public webinar room. And if you would like to hold a public webinar, you can for free. So come to LearnCentral.org. That's my advertisement. Coming up on the futureofeducation.com and conversations.net, Ken Robinson on January 6th, Helen Michelle on the 7th, Daniel Pink on the 21st, and February 3rd, James Paul G. We'll have lots more, but those are the ones we've got committed. Clay Shirky, Doc Searles, Tim Magner, David Thornburg, Dennis Litke, and more are all committed. If you've missed past sessions, Angela Myers yesterday on Classroom Habitudes. Great fun talking to her. Rachel Dredson from Frontline's Digital Nation, uh, also from this week. Uh, Curtis Bonk on The World is Open. Dan Willingham on Why Students Don't Like School. And Larry Cuban on School Reform and much, much more. Futureofeducation.com and look for the archives. If this is your first time in Illuminate, this is a participative environment, and we want you to know how to participate. With a nice, intimate group like this, please feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat. To raise your hand, you use the little um, button that is a hand with a green up arrow. And that would let you actually take the microphone. Once you've raised your hand, I'll give you the mic. If you think you might want to ask a question using the microphone, do go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your mic is working. To the right of that are these. There's a green check and a red X. That's your way of answering yes and no if we ask a question of you, the audience. And then down here, you'll see this is the uh, Send button for sending a message in the chat. You've probably already figured that out. You'll notice that you can send chat messages to other individuals in the session, but be aware that Elizabeth and I will both see those chat messages. There's nothing entirely private. And then you'll see the talk button, which is if we give you the microphone or you ask for it, you click on that button to toggle your microphone on and off. So now we're going to use the whiteboard tools. And I'm going to give you whiteboard permissions. And we'll see where people are listening from tonight. Click on the little wand with the red star and then click on the map to let us know where you're listening from. Hey, we have Australia. Awesome. Now oh, look, Peggy's arrived. When Peggy's arrived, you know that the meeting is going to start. Peggy and Kim, both co-hosts of the Saturday Live show. Really fun show this Saturday on the use of cell phones in schools. That's Classroom 2.0's live show. With Liz Kolb, that's right. 
Well, lots of fun to have you all here. Okay, so we're going to move forward. So Elizabeth, it really was fun for me to to read the book and to begin to make connections. Um, as I mentioned beforehand, we're both in the Sacramento area. We both have college-age daughters who like theater or acting, and we both have kids in the Horizon program. I mean, what more mm -hmm. connection could you have than that? <laughs> That's pretty huge. It's <laughs> wonderful. Well, it was a lot of fun for me. Okay, so I'm going to read from your book your definition of virtual schooling. And for those who want to know, this is... That is amazing that you... Yeah. What's that? This is our definition that we feel the market needs to adapt, adopt. Okay, well, we're going to make an effort in that area by reading it out loud. Okay. We define virtual schooling okay. by the potential it holds. Is this the right paragraph for you? Yes, that's, that's exactly where I have it beer, uh, beer marked <laughs> on my book for you. So there you go, another odd. <laughs> we see it as a personalized learning approach accomplished by leveraging the best of virtual and classroom-based schools and programs tailored to a child's needs and interests. And then you go on to say that virtual schooling is positioned to create a 21st century revolution that will change our society. Hyperbole, or do you really feel that strongly? I feel that strongly, and, and so do my co-authors, who Lisa Gillis has significant background in building virtual schools, but we actually debated long and hard um, writing the first book ever for parents on this emerging trend in education. We felt that it was too premature to define, as some others now, as virtual schooling is just virtual schools, that all virtual schooling eventually would the blended model of a hybrid of, of some learning in a classroom and some learning online it would eventually be the hybrid model. Hybrid schools would be the future. And if we have all this massive amount of technology and children can learn any subject online, of course they still want to have an interactive environment in a classroom setting that works for them. So we believe wholeheartedly that if we have all this technology, and yet if we look back to many thought leaders and people we respect so much, as Marie Montessori and so many others of Einstein and that believe that each, as we do, each child has a unique path. Uh, they have their own skill sets and aspirations and interests. So why would we not combine the two? Uh, virtual schooling is not putting your kid in front of a computer and using rote learning curriculum, which has been done in traditional schools for some time. Why would we do that? That's going backwards, and we're just leveraging technology in an ineffective way. So all children, we make this statement in the book, are virtual schoolers because our children are using technology. They've got their iTouch, their iPhone, their iPod. They they can download so many resources that iTunes U. They're taking you know live classes online. They're doing research. They are digital natives. So all of their schooling part will be done in a classroom, and part will be done in a virtual learning environment. That is a great answer. So uh, just for those who are listening, um, there are some connections here with previous interviews, uh, the Michael Horn interview series, uh, both on disrupting class and on yeah. the uh, InnoCite uh, research reports, and also Susan Patrick from my name call. OK, so uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to bring up yeah. your website. And this is the most uh, professional-looking bio I've seen in a long time. Oh, you're bringing up my business bio. Yes. Okay, we do have a website around the book that we did. Yes, but this is my business website. But thank you. So let me get. Where's the biography? I'm going to go. With I'm in the branding, and I'm in the branding. <laughs> I'm in the branding and marketing business. So I have a little heads up. Oh. I build. Uh, brands and companies for clients. So I, I know what, what I'm doing a little bit. You obviously do know what you're doing a little bit because this site looks so professional. And uh, so would you tell us a little bit without our reading through this biography, can you give us a sense of your background and what you do? 
actually, you know how in life, this is what I like with my children, my three daughters to be raised, is that you, you pursue a passion and it evolves into something else and then it moves into something else and the dream gets bigger. And then in hindsight, you look back and you can see the connections and how what got you here wasn't really evident. So I actually have a decided I had a, a real change in my life about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and I decided to, um, I started homeschooling my kids quite some time before that, and I kind of stepped out of the traditional work environment, and I loved it, and I found very quickly that there were no resources at that time in 1998. There was not a lot of online information for families that chose to homeschool. So I decided to start a, a dot com that I have eventually sold to the other partner, and for, quickly we decided to embrace the diversity in the homeschool community with different approaches to homeschooling, and we we called in all the thought leaders and experts from across the board to unschooling, to interested learning, to school at home, to Christian homeschoolers, and said, you know, we want to answer all the questions for families. So I did that for five years, and, and Time Warner at the time asked us to write a book on the preeminent guide to homeschooling. So that was really one part of my education, and by deciding to educate my children in a very untraditional way, and we got to do some very fun things. We traveled with the scientists who found the Titanic. Um, we met Sally Ride. My kids had a great, continue to have a great education, and when I have always been... Um, passionate about marketing and seeing what others didn't see to build an emerging market and to to brand it and, and push it out there. So I literally um, met, started interviewing like Robert Kiyosaki from the Rich Dad Poor Dad series and Bob Ballard. And through those associations, I had them say, you know, we would love for you to help build our homeschool divisions or our education division. So my consulting career started to really take off, and uh, I moved more into that role and sold my interest in, in the dot-com, and literally have been, I love for clients, I see potentials in new emerging markets, and I help brand it and, and differentiate it and classify it and then build the book franchises around it or package the whole concept. And the reason that I wrote this book in virtual schooling is that I saw it was a, it needed to be written, and I work with a lot of publishers, and they said, "What one book hasn't been written in education?" And I said, "Virtual schooling." And I I serve on a, I'm a president of the school board for a California Academy of Virtual School, and I really felt that more parents needed to find out about the resources that are there that they may not know of. So. I decided I called in a couple of friends of mine who have significant experience in this space and said, let's, let's write a book. Let's get the message out there. Um, and I'm actually, I don't want to say not in education anymore. I just felt that this book was important and I feel that that's my responsibility as an early adapter. Homeschooling families, although most, if you define, and you'll see in the book we define virtual schools by you know, part-time, private, like a public virtual school, which is government-funded. It's a virtual, it's a traditional school in a lot of ways. But we def make those definitions. But I really felt that parents needed to find out about these resources. But homeschooling families were early adapters of virtual education. I mean, I was using programs way before, you know, and I, whatever was available, we were leveraging it. So a lot of families that homeschool, in a sense, were early adapters of virtual education and had seen it evolve. So I'd like to make a connection because I think that uh, there's there's a there's a fascinating connection here between your ability to brand and um, be independent and the opportunities for students to do the same kinds of things with their own education and then careers. Are, do you see that as well? Yes. Yes, I, I wish I could have, that would be my third <laughs> project that I would work on because it's so important and I, I don't like when people minimize how important it is to define themselves and build their personal brand and, and as a matter of fact, I have a, a great, I work with some wonderful, brilliant people in, in the disruptive web and social media and now more than ever it's so important to brand yourself, your, your, your persona, your personal brand. 
that people can find out about you. So I, I think it's important. I'm I'm working on that with my 20 year old daughter, uh, in a sense of to be able to. It's you know Arnold Schwarzenegger made a great quote, love him or hate him, a, a while back. If you can be the best painter in the world, but if you don't market yourself and nobody finds your work, how have you really? had people connect to your work and how have you shared your passion. So I, I love doing that. I, I have an interesting new client who is it's a gonna be a very big movement in business and it was called a very boring name originally based on research with the US Air Force. So I came in and helped create a name and built the franchise and the packaging around it and it, I hope it will be much more successful for the the author and the lead uh, faculty and it, it, again, I, I take note when people say, well, it's just packaging. Well, you know what? Perception is reality. Well, so for those who are listening, I did an interview with, with Dan Shawbell on Me 2.0 and personal branding. And we tried to take you know, what, what he essentially uses sort of very marketing-oriented phrases and to translate them into this idea of uh, actual educational outcomes. Uh, a lot of fun. And, and Elizabeth, you and I are going to have to connect because I've been working with our 21-year-old daughter and helping her build a brand around her passion, which is uh, theater and autism, and uh, probably very similar ways. And I'm going to give a shout out for Weebly.com, which uh, really helps people to do that. Okay, so uh, um, you keep talking about the .com, but you don't mention it by name. Are there legal restrictions on your discussing that, or is it that you're just modest? Is there a reason you're not saying the actual domain? Um, it's a very prominent one, and it's it's a dot, it's a dot com, and it's in high school. It's just not what it. It was not. It stayed pretty stagnant, and I'm not I'm not proud of where oh. it is right now. It, it was a very much a front runner. I get it. So, if I'm in packaging and branding and marketing, I don't want anybody to look at it and go, "Oh my lord, this is what you were involved in." Got it. Understood. <laughs> Okay, so you said one thing in the book also, you and your co-author said one thing in the book that really kind of struck me and I was surprised that I hadn't thought of it in this simple way before. Virtual schooling is as much a new approach to education as online shopping has been to commerce. Have other people responded as positively to that single sentence as I am? Yes. And it's you mentioned Michael Horn and, and others who you know and Susan Patrick who has really been working with providers in the industry and that's why this book is we feel so important and the industry the virtual schooling industry have really embraced it and and helped more parents get it but yes it's it is if you think about the you know we talk about the printing press and the book and this is revolutionary to who our children can be safely mentored with and who they can you know learn about through a program like all kinds of free resources that are out there so it's to me when i say shopping for your education it also means i'm very proactive with my children's education i have a very eclectic mix and i a lot of parents email me all the time with their eclectic mixes and i just got off a plane and the gentleman was telling me where his kids went to school and you know i have one child in roseville in a hybrid school which is mentioned quite a bit in the book because I, Lisa and I and Christina just adamantly, my co-authors believe, we define it as one approach to virtual schooling, but hybrid schools are just spectacular. And I really hope most, more states and districts can can get that nice blend. But in terms of the e-commerce, it's it's being able to find the best resources for your child when they need that support in school. And it's <clears throat> it's really to do the research and find which they are. We none of us can, and no matter how great our child's school is, the world is changing so quickly. And that used to be said years ago. Well, it's on. It's lightning speed now. And the jobs that our children will pursue, I don't believe that we're educating them for those jobs now. So I think it's critical that we look, we help educate them. That education is a kind of a shopping cart item. Find out what works best for you. They are going to be learning the rest of their lives, lifelong learning. They'll be getting different degrees. They're gonna, you know, if you were a marketer like myself, and look what's happened with social media and how it's the new normal and what's changed. Well, very few schools are teaching that. So we have to help our children understand that the world is changing so quickly, and you have to continue to find the information to consider education 
meeting your needs and not just this big conglomerate where you go in and you're a cog and you sort of go through, and I'm not, my husband's a public school teacher. Schools, many schools do the very best they can and they get great results. But again, it's the, I take it from the perspective, what's best for the child, period. So I want to drill down on the learning piece and sort of that pedagogical philosophical piece. Mm -hmm. But before I do so, a large part of the book is just about how this works. You know, how does this actually work in practice? Am mm -hmm. I the first one to say that that's confusing? In terms of, I'm sorry, repeat oh. the question. It's confusing to say how does it work well, as opposed to what it I, is. I, you know, I potentially live in this world. You know, we have kids in a in in the Horizon program, and I'm doing online interviews and all kinds of material. And and yes. I can't even say that I fully grasped all of the uh, seven approaches and exactly how everything interplays. And, and it felt to me like, wow, if I, this were the first time I were I learning know. about this, I'd be pretty darn confused. Well, and Lisa Gilson and I, my co, my primary co-author, you know, we we really had many a late nights of discussion on that. So, from my homeschooling background, this is how the positioning came from this. And I credit Lisa so much for she is just really one of the few in the virtual schooling market. She is just knows her business. She's developed schools. Her you'll see in the back of a great background, amazing. But we came back to. And not the virtual schooling, and in some it is homeschooling, but when I was a, a thought leader and very involved in the homeschool community, homeschooling is a broad term. There are many approaches to homeschooling. So I really felt that we had an obligation to virtual schooling. There is not one approach to virtual schooling. So we tried to come up, we, we defined the different approaches to it, and we came from the perspective that most parents won't understand it. And we also, working with our publisher, this was not an easy book to write because we could have written a book purely from the indus current industry's perspective of what virtual schooling is, but we felt that was a disservice to where the industry is going, where the movement is going, and to parents to understand if my child attends a traditional public school down the street, he or she is still a virtual schooler. Here I can supplement their income. So uh, I'm sorry, their income. I just came from a business meeting. I apologize for that. They can supplement their, their education at school. So I'm, I'm hoping it wasn't too confusing for others. It was here's the broad definition. Here's the different approaches. And it's, it's not easy writing, writing the first book on a subject in a burgeoning and explosive growth industry. Well, I don't think it's confusing because you have done a good job explaining it. I think it's just a very rich landscape of, of opportunity across a spectrum that has many different aspects to it. And so in, in describing those choices, it felt like, wow, there, there's a lot of choice here. In, in fact, I wondered, do you get the reaction from people that this is overwhelming and it's more work than I want to go through? Yes, I had that experience when I had worked with thousands of homeschooling parents years ago too. It's like this sounds great for somebody else. But again, we without it, we didn't want the, the book, this is a defining book for virtual schooling, saying there are public virtual schools. You can sign up for them. It's all inclusive. It's very much like a traditional school. There's report cards. It's great. You get a diploma. But there are ways to leverage all the resources out there, like mobile schooling. Most children have, hi, have an iPod or an iPhone, so how can you supplement their learning but, and also have them follow a passion, which most parents are doing, but leveraging all the resources that are out there. So we really combine those pieces together. And uh, it, it's not a, and most people don't understand what virtual schooling is outside of parents who have explored this option. They just sort of have a, oh, what is that school online? So we realize that it, it's not a simple subject to understand very quickly. And we do try to break it down in the book of how many, uh, Lisa did a very good job of going through and being very fair in the approach I take with my children, which is a kind of a blended approach. That it does, you know, here's 
the theory is this is how many hours it would take a day. And the reality is you, in, especially in the lower grades, there has to be a parent that's at home or a grandparent or another family member who's involved in their child's education. Um, depending on the approach, if your child is, now if you're just, your children are in a traditional school and you're supplementing, here's all these great race resources. If your child is going to virtual school full time or do a combination, you are involved. You have, there are hours of your day that you're spending doing work with your child, again, depending on their age. Well, I, I actually really liked the last section, the uh, quick answer guide, and uh, oh, might almost point people to that first as a way of kind of getting their their arms wrapped around the topic. Do you, um, in, in the book, but go ahead. no, yes. no, go ahead. Yes. Oh, that was yeah. Lee, that was Lisa's suggestion to add, which was a very good one because she, again, we spent many a late nights going back and forth. Of we felt such a responsibility to to write from a broader perspective. If and I came from my first book that I wrote, and I wanted chapter one to be so. We both wanted it to be so strong that parents would just you talk about theory that they it would connect to them, and they would we would just say, look at the opportunity that's here. We which approach you take or don't, but just look at the opportunity. We wanted it to be an advocacy. We wanted it to really a call to action. And yet, then we go into the different approaches. But the, the, quick, the, the section is very much like, okay, they have to, you know, down and dirty, you know, what is this? How do I define it? And how do I, how do I find what that type of school is? So Peggy asked the question, is it a how-to book or more theoretical? My answer would be that it's actually kind of both. And then in that first chapter, you do a really good job of sort of showing through your own family the enormous potential. And people, I have friends who don't have children who live in all different parts of the world, and people I've met, and I said, I picked it up, and, that, and they said, I was so envious of your, and it's just not my children's education. I was envious to think that children could have such a rich education, that they were just so sophisticated in that education because it was very much tailored to personalized learning. And Lisa and I feel adamant about personalized learning. So uh, um, I, I wrote down several sort of myths that it seems that you point out in the book that relate specifically to virtual schooling. So can I go down the list and have you respond to them? I will do my best. <laughs> okay. The first one was that. And are you going to ask? Are you going to ask the ask question first? The which question? <laughs> the socialization. No, no, no. Because well, it's, because we did, because we've done home because we've done homeschooling. We know that well, and it's also yes. Um, we've definitely noticed a real <laughs> change in the last ten years. When we did homeschooling ten years ago, yes. there was really a negative stigma. Uh, we felt a lot of friends we just could not understand why we would do it. And I don't feel that, that that same stigma exists. And that was always one of the first questions was socialization in sports. You know, how are your kids going to have any friends? Yes. So I wasn't going to start there, but you've put me there. So let's, yes, let's I, answer it. <laughs> that was the first question. I was on Fox and Friends recently in September, and that was the first, and I was prepared for it. I knew it was coming. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've answered that question for 13 years because of the homeschooling background. Um, and, and again, it's I always used to advocate. You know, where do you want your children to learn great manners and to connect with people? It's not from other children. It's from other adults. And my children are very outgoing. And, and most activities and communities and sports are are sponsored by the the, the communities. They're no longer by the schools. So. I don't, you know, and you go through, look, we, we talk about how many hours a day a, a child is spent on the computer. It's not that significant. And they are still connecting, like, there are different days, like in some of the virtual academies that we talked about. It will tell you some of the different activities that the schools do. The children do get together. They're, they're not, you know, I, I had actually wrote, we had written a quote about, they're not sitting on their computer you know, a freak eight to ten hours a day and, you know, plotting to take down Langley. This is not, a typical, this is not a, a virtual schooling child. They're learning online. They're going out. They're doing things in the community. The high school students are working part time. They're following their passion because they have more time to go in, like your daughter's in theater. So if you can get your education done in a couple hours a day, it frees you up. My daughter, one of my daughters, is writing a book to do a lot of other things. So children have you do have to work harder. To be honest with you, unless there's a, a 
some of these public uh, virtual academies that are run by K-12 and Connections and Insight Schools, they have opportunities for kids to get together depending on the, the school. But, you know, for my children, you know, we have to make an effort. We have to, I mean, my kids get involved in everything. My daughter, my 17-year-old's been, she goes to every homecoming from all the local schools because she can. She gets invited to them. But we do have to make more of an effort to find the programs that she wants to do because we're not privy to different clubs because our her school setting, she's completely independent virtual schooling through Horizons, but there is no seat-based learning component for her. Well, so, it, so I hope I answered it. I, in the, the aspect. Yeah, go ahead. I think I think the socialization is one of the best reasons to virtual school. To, if you do full-time virtual schooling or homeschooling, as we've mentioned, I think that's one of the best reasons. I think you 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 meet so many children who have been sort of out of that environment, and they're they're mature and they are very self-directed and they have a responsibility for their education, and they do well in different settings with adults. Uh, I just I see it as just a big positive. And I think we're beginning to, t we're going to move into the learning piece here, but I think you're beginning to touch on that, which is okay. if, if, you, if a student is engaged, then even if it's more work, it's probably much more fun to be doing. Exactly, and 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 there are some things that may not be, and and now this is my approach, but it may not work if you're in a a K-12 virtual academy. It's a very rigorous curriculum, and the children go through a lot. Uh, we have definitely taken a much more personalized learning to our virtual schooling for the kids. So, but we know if they get into high school, there are certain subjects they have to learn. They may we talk about it in the book. Lisa and I both talk about it and how we approached. It for her her daughter Becca and my daughter Mackenzie. Um, they there was a subject that they were both having some issues with, and you know like my youngest Mackenzie, she's not that excited about algebra at all, has zero interest in it. So we looked for ways to to supplement that and find resources for her online and 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 books that really helped her understand that subject better. And there are some some learning pieces that the children are not passionate, my girls are not passionate about. And what we've always done is said it's a means to an end. You need to learn this to go to that next level. Not everything in life is going to be every subject you have to learn or every knowledge you have to gain is going to be massively it's going to be your passion. But it's something to get you that you have to go to that next level to pursue something that you are passionate about. So you don't mention this specifically in the book, but it occurs to me that one of the possible myths is although you address it, you don't, I don't think you call it out as a myth, is that uh, virtual schooling is for everyone. What I hear you saying is this is not necessarily for everyone. No, I, I hear, yes. If, okay, we, again, we, if you say, how many, does your child use the computer? Are they using their iPod? Are they listening to lectures online? We make the case for the rest of their life they already are a virtual schooler. It's just the method and how are they a full time virtual schooler or are they using um they go into a traditional school and just supplementing using some virtual schooling courses online. So we sort of created into one definition of virtual schooling. Okay. So in terms of a full time virtual school, it's not for everybody. Absolutely. If you to, to enroll in a, virtu a public virtual school or a private, it is not for every family. It's it's very much like homeschooling. I mean, it is not like homeschooling, but like homeschooling is not for every parent. Absolutely. But virtual schooling, the same thing. It it works wonderful for some families and children, and for others, it's not a good fit at all. So we're getting some response in the chat. Peggy is a. a Principal and others, and and I think part of the, part of what I'd like to do is is I kind see. of def help to define that when you talk about virtual schooling, you are talking about a wide range of schooling options, yes. where from all the way from just one small portion being virtual to the whole experience being virtual. So this is this is um, sort of a yes. broader view of the potential of virtual schooling in, in all kinds of models, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's move. Where, there's, where there is a virtual environment at some level. Yes. Where there's a virtual environment at some level. If it's full-time virtual school, 
to supplemental virtual school to virtual schooling from the aspect of using tutor online or using your iPhone when children are downloading lessons. We consider that still virtual schooling. It's just that's not all encompassing virtual schooling. Okay, so we'll move to learning. Uh, in the book you say, okay. the human interaction necessary to educate a child, to engage students, teachers, and parents is the foundation of learning. Regardless of the technological advances for learning, nothing can replace you and your commitment to your child's success. Now, because of the gap in the phone, I... Did you want me to well, respond I, to that? I, 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 I really, didn't know if you were going to respond or if you I wanted to ask a question related to it. But that seems to me to do a very good job of saying that, that there are a wide range of ways to do this. Yes. And you have to fundamentally find what works best for your family and your children or your child. Because if it's something that is detrimental to your family, to your finances, to the, you know, the balance in your family, things that you have to do for your other children, then it's not a good fit. So it's always what works for the family and what works for the child. So I've called this before uh, mass customization, the sense that we want our children to have a, mm -hmm. an experience in schools, but we also have this expectation of customization. And I think uh, a part of what you do as well, well also in the book is to kind of point us toward the sense of self-directed learning, learning how to learn. So. Um, yes. That can take place, obviously, in a variety of settings. But do we have more of an expectation of this mass customization? And how do we turn that into helping uh, students have a desire to be self-directed? The self-directed piece, we, we include that a lot in the high school section because that's when children, the, the teenagers can be much more. They have they have the ability to do so. From from my perspective of what I've done with my children is very early on, you know, we 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 always saw ourselves as much more of an advocate and a facilitator to find them the resources and inspire them, but we quickly we really wanted them at some point to to be responsible for their education and to be self-directed learners, but how to be a self-directed learner from my experience is that we showed them how they learn best. We helped them understand that if something didn't work for them to comprehend a subject, they had to find, you know, based on their learning style, what worked better for them. And, and it, it's all as possible to try to use those, those resources. So self-directed learning, if you think about when they leave school, and again, going back to how quickly the world's changing and industries are just reinventing themselves overnight, is the jobs that most of our children will pursue probably don't even exist today. So we need to help them understand that education is lifelong, one, two, to be self-directed learners. This will be a big part of they'll probably get their master's degree online if they pursue that. So helping them understand how to be self-directed learners and find, we talk a little bit about them learning how to do research in this information age, how to find relevant research and determine what, what that is. But a self-directed learner is somebody who takes charge of their education but doesn't need, and I think of being a self-directed learner is much easier in a virtual schooling, full-time virtual schooling, or in a homeschooling, or in a hybrid model than it is in a traditional classroom because it is not self-directed in a traditional classroom. I've talked a lot about this on the series. It's, it is not personalized. I've talked a lot about this on the series, the difference between our 21-year-old and our 16-year-old. Do you feel like there's been a change where I don't feel like our 20, the pressure was on our 21-year-old to be that self-directed? It was almost like uh, it was better to be to conform and to follow, and that there has been a change in the last several years, really toward the self-directed model. Have you, have you felt the same shift? Absolutely, and and I think it's also I see that uh, Deborah has uh, pinged in here. Self-directed learner or the folks in the room is, you know, I say this to my girls all the time. I mean, every day I'm learning something. It's it's part of if you continue to evolve and and continue to educate yourself and to. It's not even about that your life isn't fabulous now. It's continuing to learn and how you can add more value to your company or add more to your business and add more value to your family 
we are learning every day, and that's just part of life. If you don't separate it from living, learning is living. And being self-directed is, I'm interested in this subject, or I'm interested in pursuing this as a career. I'm going to go find the necessary resources. That's, to me, a self-directed learner. And they're going to, how many jobs are our children going to have? They're not going to that same one company that's going to take care of them, and then they get the, the gold watch out the door. It's, they're going to have multiple careers, and part of that will be continuing to evolve and learn more and explore different careers. That's, and I think it's an absolute priority that we help them understand that, that you know, I wish I had the ability that kids do now to kind of reinvent themselves and pursue a career, and if it's not a good fit, they're, they the stigma, they move on. They find something else that they're they're not past, that they're passionate about, or they evolve to the next level and figure out a completely different career. And that's why that's so strong in the high school section. Of uh, I have a daughter who will be going to transferring to hopefully Berkeley or um, she, although she saw the campus at Santa Barbara and went, okay, this is pretty nice too. But she's transferring as a junior and she's not sure what she wants to do and that's okay because she's, she's going to figure it out. But I feel like she's got the resources to understand that <clears throat> she's going to be, she's going to find those resources herself. She's not going to, a counselor say, well, what about this? That's just not, Again, they will have so many different careers throughout their life and they need those tools to pursue and find out what they're passionate about and then go find the resources to make it happen. So I'm going to explore just briefly this idea that I've, I had in my mind that I haven't really fully fleshed out before, but I'll, but I'll say here kind of aloud, which is it seems to me that our schools have helped to do that for some small percentage of students, but that we're now expecting a much larger mm -hmm. percentage of students to need that. And so this expectation that, that maybe in a traditional school environment in the past, some small percentage of students really connected that way, they connected with their teachers, and, and the rest were doing what we wanted them to do, which was to, to be there, to listen, to pay attention, and to follow instructions. But now we're saying, okay, that can't just be the top 5% anymore. It's got to be a major portion of our student body. Yes. And I, I can tell you that our public schools are just absolutely ill-equipped to do so. It's just not, it's the parent's responsibility and it ultimately is the child or the teen's responsibility. And I think that there, no matter what school your child's attending, if you're one of the lucky few that there's a counselor, and I know there's some great ones, but it, again, it just changes so quickly in terms of the different professions that are out there. We, we just have to prepare our children for a world that we've never walked in before. We don't have any idea, so it's critical that they have those skills to go out and find the best resources and continue to learn. But no, it's, I don't see it all. Again, my husband's a high school teacher. I just do not see how our schools are prepared to take that personalized learning piece to help a child. You know, it's to get into college is the next thing, but what's their major? You know, what is it that they're going to go? It would be great if they had a general idea. And I think that very wealthy families that my niece went through one of those counseling programs and had a company that went through, but that, that's not for all children. That's not something that a lot of families can afford. So Deborah in the chat just said something that uh, uh, attracted my attention and Deb from Alaska as well. Interesting, my generation was told to be practical, not passionate. Boy, I think Deborah, you've really captured something there. <laughs> Okay, two more quick things. She did. It, it, that, yes. So two more quick things before we shift to Q&A. If you've got a question for Elizabeth, please get ready. Uh, I think, Peggy, you've had a couple uh, that you're, you're going to be able to ask. Um, Elizabeth, quickly, tell us the role of mentors in virtual. Well, we, we do a great thing about the lens that your children see. Um, I've always been, we've had some real, real time or physical mentors in our children's lives, but you know, a mentor for me has been people that I've never met, that I've studied and learned from. So we talk about Richard Sandor in here, and we talk about Stephen Chu, and, and that your children, because of technology and the internet and virtual schooling by our definition, you know, my children have been for years used iTunes U, all these free resources, and to me, um, I have a, ch a daughter who listens to all kinds of Berkeley um, lectures, and to me those are mentors. So there's somebody that, you know, like Bob Ballard is a mentor in a sense. They, they have a passion for science. 
they can have that person be their mentor. Um, there's certainly you could take it to um, my children take a couple of online classes and interestingly enough, a lot of the parents like at uh, universalclass.com, we've bought different you know shopping there you go it, education is a shopping cart. We've downloaded and ordered a class. And lovely, wonderful people who teachers, and a lot of them are homeschooling parents, which is interesting, who will grade the papers and, and really be kind of a virtual mentor as well. Great. And new to me, I'd never heard this before, was this concept of natural instincts. Have I just missed the boat here? Or is that something everybody knows about but me? No, not at all. I mean, everybody knows Briggs Meyer, and and I have been involved with uh, the Colby Index, and I I really wanted that to be a part of the book. Um, you know, we have our when I had first wrote a book, it's what was real eye opening for me is even some books that are really well known that they combine in, intelligence with learning styles, and they're completely different. So you know, a learning style is how your child takes in information, and they're born with one that that's very strong. It's much more their natural, their auditory, visual. So, you know, finding that out helps. I mean, you can't spend the rest of your life going, oh, I'm only auditory, I can't look at anything. But knowing that they learn best by listening or visual is, is a great resource for them. But Colby is an index that Kathy Colby designed. A lot of big companies use it. it it's very mathematical. It, it's it's concrete, and it is your natural instinct in a situation of how you work and how you react. So it helps you type like the four, your natural uh, modus operandi and the four geniuses. And it's a great resource for parents. Um, and it's online. You can take it. It's like a shopping cart item in a sense, and it has all the methodology, and it will help your child. My kids took it when they were younger. And an example of I have a daughter who is one of the that she's very and there is no bad scores. It's just this is your natural instinct in a setting. This is how you react. This is where your genius lies outside of necessarily intelligence. It's how you react. And I have a child who is fact finder follow through, which is one of the modes the modes. And she likes a lot of information, but she likes to she's information based and research based. And we had conflict with that because I'm a quick start. So I, I take a you know, I get quickly understand what I need to know and I move on a project. So big companies use the Colby Index to build successful teams. And I think it's an incredible resource for parents to have their child do and especially for a, a high school student or a college student who's really starting to look at their careers. It actually comes up with it's funny is when I did mine years ago, I had done a lot of the careers that were on there. So it, it can actually give you some suggestions of careers that would be well suited to your natural instincts. Okay, so much fun. But we we we've got to turn it over to Q and A and Peggy, I think uh are you Okay. Do you have your mic with you tonight, Peggy? I love hearing you speak. So if you want to ask a question, I'm going to give you the mic and put it in the chat or grab the microphone. No headset on. <laughs> okay, so Peggy asks, how are virtually schooled students dealing with issues related to college admission? Well, I think it again it goes it depends back to the school, you know, if they're doing uh virtual schooling full time if they're going to a and Lisa could do a very good job answering that because she's seen many go through that. Um, a couple of companies talked about how many their children that had graduated from a virtual academy were accepted into colleges. I think the stigma is is quickly changing that in the sense they prepare the same way as other children do. They get a diploma if you're in a full time public or private virtual school and they pursue the same way. They've taken the AP classes and, and done what they've needed to do. Uh, my children who've done much more of an independent virtual schooling and a hybrid school, uh, we've opted early on to do more the junior college approach first. But like with homeschooling back in the day, homeschoolers were not, it was much tougher to get in and to be accepted. But now that's not the, the, that's not the reality at all. Homeschoolers are Actually, I think they even have a higher level of acceptance in many schools. So it is very close to the same. I'm sure there's some few differences, and, and that would be uh, you would talk to your virtual academy or your virtual school for those things for career placement. And some of the schools, I think Insight does a lot of um, college prep and, and career placement. They have counselors 
it's just because it's a virtual school doesn't mean that they don't they don't have a school bus, but they have counselors. You know, I'm kind of intrigued. Also, I interviewed Maya Frost on her book, The New Global Student, and there's almost the degree to which this sort of sense of the admissions office being the great gatekeeper kind of goes away when you're working on passion. It, it, absolutely, and I think it also it, it depends on if it's a public school or a private um, college too. It's, you know, it's pretty much based on, based on your grade. Um, you don't have to put in a, an essay on a, on a public school. It's a, a, a quick letter, but um, it, I think everybody takes note, even in a regimented system, of somebody who's passionate about what they're doing, and they have a very lot of energy and a commitment. So I said that speaking as a child. Of a, of a father who was well known in, in admission, so I'm sure I'm going to hear from him on that. Okay, so uh, do we have another question? <laughs> what, did, what is your advice on the best way to get started for single income family financially? That is my biggest hurdle right now. I will get there, but advice is welcome. And before you answer that, Elizabeth, I want to make a, an observation that you kind of think out of the box both about school and work and family. And that it, as you answer that question in the book, I hear this sort of independence, uh, this out-of-box thinking from you on this topic. Yes, I'm kind of a rebel. I just, in a good way, I think. So I, I, I choose to, a uh, couple things lately we've had to advocate for our kids. But that's just me. I, I like to do things differently and, and what works best. And, and I, you know, that's my business too. I like to see what others don't see and, and create bring something to the forefront. I, I, I get a lot of energy from that. So That's my passion. How's that? Yeah, Deborah's asking, have you written anything about refinding passion? As a matter of fact, <laughs> she's, well, she's good timing. Um, I have been a speaker at an event in Maui for seven years that clients put together. It's a very exclusive wealth retreat, and I have done a workshop on finding, really truly finding your true dream and your passion and your purpose. And I've written an ebook on it and done workshops. So I, that will be coming out in January. I'm, I'm going back and uh, haven't done that professionally per se, but yes, I, I have written that. Uh, it, it, we talk about that in the book too, in customized learning and helping your child find their passion. But in January, I will be having an ebook out. Um, about determining your real passion and purpose in life. Yeah, Deborah, you have to figure out a way to fly to Maui, and then you have to figure out a way to get invited to that event in order to hear that advice. <laughs> no, it'll be online. <laughs> it'll be online. It used to be just in Maui. <laughs> hey, so do we have Lisa here in the room? I, I, it didn't occur to me until a couple of minutes ago. I looked down and saw Lisa's name, and is that your co-author? Yes, it would be great if she was here. I w actually had. Um, we had set this up so long ago, Steve, that uh, it was on my schedule. And then I looked at it and I went, I should have had Lisa do this. It was just crazy. So I, she's there. That would be great. She's turned her mic on. Lisa, can you say anything? I don't know that we're... I think she's still here. Her, her, she's on and her mic is on. But we're not yes. hearing anything. Lisa, I don't know if you ran the, the uh, audio setup wizard. Gosh, it would be fun to hear from you. Can, can you hear me now? Yay! We can. Can, can you? Yay! Hey. <laughs> you can. Yay! I actually, uh, I uh, actually like turned up my mic. What a concept! <laughs> so, uh, hi guys. Hi Steve. Hi Elizabeth. And um, yep, I, I found out about this fabulous Ooh. Illuminate session and, and about this amazing book and thought maybe I'd just kind of <laughs> pop in and check it out. You are so funny. Gosh, I'm so sorry funny. we haven't had you talking. <laughs> well, Elizabeth has done a great job. <laughs> well, we're just going to have to do this again, Lisa, and focus on you. Oh, well, <laughs> it's been a great yes. session. Yes. And, um, there, there were some, go ahead. You know, I think um, the strength that both Elizabeth and I bring to the table together as a collaborative team is that um, uh, Elizabeth certainly has lots of experience with her, with her kids and being that innovator and the, the person who is a visionary and really doing this before anybody else was doing it. 
Um, and but I have, um, you know, I've been a school teacher uh, over 20 years of um, in the education system as a teacher and a school administrator and a, a developer and an advocate and all that stuff. So we really complemented each other well. In addition, what we 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 see is that like Elizabeth came from the homeschool background, I came from the public school background, and the bridge and me meeting us in the middle was virtual schooling because it was common to both both areas and. As we were writing this book, it was interesting to us. I know Elizabeth alluded to it earlier, but uh, both of our daughters at the exact same time were having issues in math, and we both found the same solution separately yet together in, uh, in, in enrolling them in online courses. So it was really great. Okay, so I think we've got to we've got to follow up on this. I'm just so sorry we haven't had you talking, but I think I've pulled up a picture of you. I'm going to see if I can put it up on the board. Yes, okay. yes actually, this could be potentially scary. I want you to know, by the way. Go ahead. I want you to know there's a couple of other Lisa Gillis's out there, and uh, one of them is not me. So we'll see if you pick the right picture. Let's see how us. good my Googling is. <laughs> Oh, that is me! Yes. <laughs> Thank goodness. Here, watch, watch this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna give you the limelight for a minute here. Although the name's gonna be wrong. Uh, okay, go for it. Well, well you should actually, definitely. If I would, I think you should absolutely have Lisa back on it. At some time, she can go into the nitty gritty in, in terms of the full time virtual schools and the classroom based, and as an educator. And I think you get a lot of teachers and a lot of administrators who really want to figure out how to do virtual schooling in their in their schools and districts. It would be a great, great uh, session to do. So. Highly encourage Lisa, that. put your email in the chat, and you can yeah, send it to me really privately fun. if you'd like, and I'll send you an email. And I'm going to turn your mic off. You can turn it back on, but we were getting an echo because you, I think it's coming through your speakers back to the microphone. Okay, just a couple of minutes left. Questions for Lisa or Elizabeth? I'm going to look at the chat here and see if I missed anything. Deb from Alaska, we're working on the first virtual high school for the state of Alaska. Is there a model or models you would recommend for us to look at? And for sure, Deb, do look at the InnoSight um, group uh, and, the, and the reports that they've been doing. And I did a, I've done a couple of interviews with um, uh, old, what's his name, uh, Michael Horn from Disrupting Class. Uh, Elizabeth, how would you answer that? I'm sorry, could you repeat it? Because you played it out a little bit. I couldn't hear it all. Oh, sorry. So the question is, they're working on the first virtual high school for the state of Alaska. Is there a model or models you would recommend to look at? I think that's a Lisa question, and it's perfect that she got on the phone. Well, Lisa, you have to turn your mic back on to talk. OK. So. Um, uh, that's Debbie, Deborah, that's wanting to do that. Um, uh, I've actually been uh, developing online high schools for, I've been in the online business developing schools for over 10 years. And, um, and currently, I'm actually the director of government affairs and school development for Insight Schools, which is part of the Apollo Group, the whole University of Phoenix system. And we have schools in 11 different states of which I, I help to, um, to develop. So. Um, this is a very deep question and not one that can be answered quickly on this uh, Illuminate because there's many different factors to consider as to whether you want to be a charter school or a district based program or full time or, or supplemental or blended or whatever. So um, yeah, go to the Insight website. Actually, you can, um, my email address is it's very easy. It's Lisa Gillis at Comcast.net. That's my personal email address. And I'd be happy to give you any kind of advice uh, that you might need um, because, as I've said, I've, I've literally developed uh, high schools in, um, in uh, over 12 different states. So I would be happy to help you out with that. Very fun. And Lisa, I'm going to turn your mic off again. Although I'm not getting the echo this time, so maybe you've figured that out. OK, so one minute to go. I'm going to put up the slide for the sessions coming up. Thanks tonight to Illuminate for uh, sponsoring. We have a new sponsor, C. Bloom and Associates. They are my uh, book buying sponsor. They're funding the heavy monthly expense I have just in buying the books for the sessions. So thanks to C. Bloom 
and Charlene and her group for being a sponsor of futureofeducation.com. Don't forget January 6th, Ken Robinson. That should be a lot of fun. Daniel Pink, James Paul G., and Alan Michelle. So a lot of fun coming up. Do we have a final question before we go? Okay, I'm going to clap. I'm using the clapping hand. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Elizabeth and Lisa, for being on. Lisa, I'm going to send you an email and would love to, to have you on uh, another time. Elizabeth, what a blast uh, to, to, to be able to talk to you. And uh, You are in my name. When I got that, I couldn't, yes, let's connect up in Lincoln. I actually drive there twice a week to take Kinsey up to her hybrid school in Roseville. So let's get together. We'll, do, we'll get together with our uh, drama-liking uh, 20 to 21 year old daughters and talk shop. Yes. In fact, I just bought a book. Well, I have three teenagers, so there's a, there's a lot of drama. In my, <laughs> well, I can match that. Uh, hey, so uh, I, in fact, I just bought a book. We're, we're at the end of the moment here, but I'll tell you, it, it's a book. It was rec it was uh, referenced in a business book I'm reading called Trust Agents, and it was about improv, and it's called Improv Wisdom. And it's about uh, the, the interesting life lessons from improv theater. And so I'll be sure to bring that. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. This is, okay. we're signing off. Thank thanks, you Elizabeth. Very much. Thanks, Lisa. Great. Thank you. The recording will be posted tomorrow. Sure appreciate everybody being here. Have a great night. <laughs> Deborah wants the after chat. I, I I think we're just going to say good night because it's just so few of us, and two of them are my wife and my daughter, so who have obviously been having sound difficulty all night because I can tell that their sound's not coming through. I get a little symbol, but thanks for being here, Tammy. Thanks for being here, Deborah, Jen, and Caroline. Sure love you. Okay, take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>